We, the generations of revolutionaries today, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And it's imperative for us that we learn from their life and experience. And one of them is, is Rosa Luxemburg. She's a figure that has been hijacked by the soft leftist, if you can, if you can call them that. People who try to, to use her to justify their, their own left reformism and putting it in a, in a radical veneer. And I think it's time that we set the record straight and that we, the IMT, reclaim Rosa Luxemburg as the revolutionary that she was. Yeah, I will focus on, on two myths that, that has been created around her. But, but first, a, a little bit of background. She was born in 1871 in the Russian-occupied Poland. She was a Pole, not allowed to speak her own language in school. She was a Jew and she was a woman. Uh, she started fighting oppression in, in a very young age. Uh, already in high school, she became politically and revolutionary active. And before she turned uh, 20, she had to flee the country uh, and move to Switzerland. In 1898, uh, she decided to move to Berlin. Uh, she decided to move there in order to participate in what was probably the strongest labor movement in the world uh, at that time, the, the German Social Democratic Party, the SPD. Uh, the leadership there, they, they found her a bit difficult to handle. So they, they tried to derail her into the women's movement of, of the SPD. Uh, but she wasn't a person that was easily derailed. Uh, and she threw herself in, into the most important debates of, of the movement at that time. Uh, when she arrived in Berlin, it, it was just in time for the essential debate about reform and, and revolution that, that uh, Edward Bernstein had raised inside the SPD. Bernstein tried to introduce a revision of Marxism uh, and actually transforming uh, the, the, the political foundation of the SPD from Marxism into reformism. Uh, and Rosa Luxemburg, she, she threw herself into this uh, also explaining it wasn't just a theoretical question. Uh, it was a question of the life of death of, of the SPD. I think if you read her text, uh, Social Reform and Revolution Today, you will find it striking that it is in many ways the exact same arguments that you can hear on the left wing today. And you can take quotes for, from her and use directly against a lot of these soft leftists uh, in the labor movement that, that we meet today all over the world, I think. And throughout her life, she played a key role in fighting the opportunist uh, reformist degeneration that happened in, in the German social democracy and, and in the Second International. A fight that ended up in her being the key part of uh, founding the German Communist Party, and also a fight that ended in her being killed for, for fighting for what she believed in. She has become somewhat of a left-wing icon, but I would say that her legacy has been grossly distorted this concept of so-called Luxembourgism has been um, invented. They present her as represent, presenting some kind of a special trend within Marxism, as, as her being both opposed to the reformists, but also the Leninist and, and the Bolshevism, like some kind of third way, a softer revolutionary way, more democratic way in their view. In reality, they try to use her to cover up uh, for their own left reformism in radical clothing. They, they, they try to portray her as some champion of working class uh, creativity and spontaneity, uh, and as being in opposition to some ultra-centralist, undemocratic Lenin, who supposedly make, made a coup in uh, Russia to set up a dictatorship under his own leadership. This is false, and I will try to explain this. Uh, but this Luxembourgism, so-called, it can seem attractive to, to young, honest revolutionaries, uh, revolutionaries who seek an alternative to what they have been told is Leninism, but is in, in actual fact Stalinism. But this idea of, of a special Luxembourgism uh, as an independent trend in opposition to Leninism and Bolshevism is false to the core. It is based on myths that is created by taking texts and quotes out of context and also hiding the fact that Luxembourg on several occasions changed her, her mind when events convinced her that, the, that her criticism of Lenin and the Bolsheviks had, had been wrong. If you make a serious study of the writings and life of Rosa Luxemburg, you can reach no other conclusion that she was a revolutionary, a communist, and on the same side of the barricade as Lenin and the Bolsheviks. The same side of the barricade that the IMT stands on. 
that there are many myths that has been created. I want to use my talk to, to try and combat the, the two uh, myths that I think are most important. Uh, the first one is uh, that she supposedly had this special theory of spontaneity uh, and was against the building of a revolutionary organization to lead the working class. Uh, and that she somehow um, predicted how the Russian revolution would end up uh, and the practical conclusion being in a, style, in a dictatorship under Stalin. And, and the practical conclusion of these Luxembourgists is, <coughs> sorry, is from that, but therefore we, sh we shouldn't build a revolutionary organization at all. And the second myth uh, is that this, she supposedly was an opponent of the Russian revolution and the Bolsheviks. But let's begin with the question of organization and spontaneity. We are told uh, that Luxembourg stood for the spontaneity of the masses and their creativity as against the Leninist model of a highly centralized monolithic revolutionary party. It is especially her work, uh, the mass strike, the political party and the trade unions that is used to create uh, this myth. But this, this claim that this text uh, support this myth, it both misses the point on why she wrote the pamphlet and against whom she was polemicizing. Uh, and furthermore, and this is general for, for, for all the claims about what Luxembourg stood for, you can only create this myth if you grossly distort the article. You cannot, in honesty, read this article and from that claim that Luxembourg dismisses the concept of revolutionary leadership. The article is analyzing the first Russian revolution in, in 1905. It's explaining in, in great detail uh, how the Russian masses rose spontaneously in mass strikes and also how they set up Soviets. Uh, the Soviets is basically workers' councils, a development of the strike committee. It was something that the Russian masses uh, found up as, as, as the need arose. It wasn't something that has been, had been described by any Marxist theoretician beforehand. Uh, and Luxembourg described this process uh, and it was these councils that in 1917 uh, became the organs of, of workers' power and took power in, in Russia. The article is written for, for a German audience. It wasn't written into a, a debate in the Russian party. Uh, it was a contribution to a debate taking place inside the SPD, the German Social Democratic Party. And it is basically a very harsh criticism of the leadership of the SPD and their behavior. Around the time of the Russian of the 1905 revolution in Russia, there was also a strife wave taking place in, in Germany. Uh, the, and a discussion was taking place inside the, the SPD uh, on the mass strike, that is uh, what, at least in Denmark, we call the general strike, uh, on how and when to use it and with what, the, what methods. In contrast to Russia, in Germany, there were strong trade unions and a strong social democratic party with, with mass roots in, in Germany. But the leaders of the German workers' movement, they treated the strikes with contempt and also said that they were immature and that they were doomed to fail. And in contrast, the Lux also Luxembourg and the revolutionary wing of the SPD, they welcomed the strikes and argued for the need of the party to intervene and to give uh, the strikes a, a political leadership and, and direction. And, and Luxembourg, she, in, her, in her criticism of the leadership of the, of the SPD, she, she compared them uh, or, or she used uh, an example saying that the SP, SPD leadership, they treated the mass movement as a pocket knife, i.e. as something you can just open and close uh, as the party found convenient. You call the masses to the street and you send them home. Instead, she said, using the example of, of Russia 1905, that the masses move without permission from any party. They, they move when they move. And she argued that when the masses move, it was the role of the party to give this movement direction and leadership. And in these ideas, she was in complete agreement with Lenin. So, so this article about the mass strike was written for this debate. Uh, as a criticism of the leadership of the German uh, SPD for not understanding how the masses move uh, and not wanting to lead the masses when they moved. It was in actual fact a criticism of the reformist actions of the leadership of, of the SPD uh, that in some ways anticipated uh, the later actions, I would say, at a time where it, it wasn't so clear uh, how, how far the reformism have had spread it in the top layer of, of the SPD. 
it wasn't a criticism of the Bolsheviks with whom she was in agreement with in regard to the 1905 revolution. In December 1905, she had gone to Poland to participate in the revolution. Uh, at that time, which, which wasn't obvious at the time, but at that time, the revolution was already at an ebb. And she got arrested in March 1906. Uh, a few months later, she, she got uh, released uh, and went uh, to Finland. Uh, in Finland, uh, many of the Bolshevik leaders were, were also present, uh, and she had long discussions with, the, with many of them, uh, including Lenin. And it became clear in these discussions that on the fundamental questions, they agreed. She participated in the Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Party in 1907. And this was a Congress where uh, you could say all the tendencies of the Russian Social Democratic Party participated, the Bolsheviks, the Mensheviks, and also the Polish uh, party that, that for historical reasons had, hadn't been part of, of the Russian Social Democratic Party uh, before. So you had people like Lenin, Trotsky, Rosa Luxemburg, Plikhanov uh, discussing the experience of the, of the first and failed Russian revolution. What was the lessons to be drawn? The revolution had drawn the different trends close, uh, but now again, the differences be began to came to the fore, the differences between the Mensheviks and Bolsheviks and so on. Uh, and this became clear in, in the discussions uh, during the, the Congress. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg, she held a long speech on behalf of the Polish party. And the main part of the speech uh, she used to, to heavily criticize the Mensheviks uh, and their conduct and their, and their line during the revolution. She criticized them for giving up the independent struggle of the working class uh, and, and criticized them for putting their trust in the bourgeoisie and the liberal parties and, uh, how can you say that? And subordinating the working class to, to the bourgeoisie, basically. She was fully on the side of the Bolsheviks uh, and praised them for the independent class policy. Uh, and she agreed with them that the next step it would have been for the masses to, to, to go forward in the Russian revolutions, uh, Russian revolution of 1905 would have been uh, for an armed uprising of the workers in Russia. So while she, she criticized the Menshevik uh, in their basic position, you could say, uh, she had one uh, concrete critical uh, remark about the Bolsheviks. And that was that she, she thought they had put too much emphasis on organizing the technical side of the, of the armed uprising. She said that the masses themselves, they would take care uh, of, of this question uh, and, and solve it during the revolution. Uh, and I think this reveal uh, also what I believe is, is her weak side uh, and something that runs through her, her entire life, that her approach to organization is a bit abstract. She has this uh, idea that problems of organization will be solved when they arise, basically, which is a consequence of, of her being in the German SPD that was very organized and where she could see the bureaucracism uh, putting a break on, on, on the movement of the masses and the workers. But I believe this, this was a mistake of hers. But, but I think if, if you look at these debates and also if you look at what she writes, it's, it's very clear that, that when she criticized the Bolsheviks, she didn't reject political leadership. Just as Lenin didn't reject the spontaneity of, of mass struggle, they agreed that the masses move when they move. It's not by order of, of any party, but when they move, it is necessary that there is a revolutionary leadership to this movement. The difference was on how much emphasis revolutionaries should put on the practical side of organizing uh, the masses taking power. And you can see this uh, with the practical consequences. Lenin uh, built the Bolsheviks uh, and Luxembourg didn't build a party in time that, that could lead the masses. And I think history has shown uh, Luxembourg to be wrong uh, in, 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 regard, in um, relation to Lenin on, on this question. Uh, connected to this question of organization, these so-called Luxembourgists, they reject the building of a revolutionary party at all. Uh, in continuation of them claiming that she was against organization, uh, they presented as her somehow anticipated um, the development of bureaucratic dictatorship uh, under Stalin, 
And also they claim that the Stalinist dictatorship, uh, at, that it was, uh, it followed naturally from Lenin's ideas on organization, implying you, sh you shouldn't uh, build a revolutionary organization because it will always end up in a, in a Stalinist bureaucratic dictatorship. Uh, they present the myth that Luxembourg was for some kind of genuine workers' democracy in opposition to the dictatorial methods of Leninism. Uh, this idea is wrong on many levels. The bureaucratic Stalinist degeneration of the Russian revolutions did not flow from Leninist view of organization from the Bolsheviks. The Stalinist degeneration was a consequence of the objective conditions in Russia in 1917 and the years after. It was the consequence of the revolution taking place uh, in a backward country uh, and the fact that the revolution remained isolated. None of the leaders of the Bolsheviks at that time imagined that the Russian revolution could lead to, to socialism uh, in, in, in Russia alone. Their idea was to hold on uh, until the workers of, of the more developed capitalist countries, especially Germany, came to their help. If, if you look at history and what actually happened in Russia, you can see that the bureaucratic regime was not a, a continuation of, of the organizational methods of the Bolsheviks or the Russian Revolution. And it wasn't a consequence of the Russian Revolution, how it took place, uh, or the worker state set up uh, under the leadership of Lenin and Trotsky and the Bolsheviks. Uh, the two regimes were separated by a river of blood. Uh, the Stalinist regime practically wiped up, out the, the old Bolshevik uh, party. If you take, uh, uh, I think many of you will have seen these pictures of, of uh, all the members of the Central Committee of the Bolsheviks during the, the revolution, the 1917 revolution, uh, and you look at what happened to these uh, people, you will see that most of them will have disappeared or been killed uh, when we came come to 1940. Uh, the Luxembourgers falsify what Lenin and the Bolsheviks really stood for in order to facilitate this myth. They portray the Bolshevik party as some kind of monolith without any free debate uh, under a highly centralized regime uh, under Lenin uh, and his dictatorship. But the truth is that the Bolshevik party had the fullest freedom of internal debate. If you read uh, about the Congresses, you can see that different opinions was being freely discussed and often in a very uh, tense atmosphere uh, and no words uh, minced. What is it that these soft leftists, these Luxembourgists really have against the Bolshevik party? It is that it wasn't a debating club. It wasn't a place where ideas could freely be discussed just, just for the sake of discussion or for individual expression. The Bolshevik party was a fighting revolutionary organization where debates were taken in order to prepare the workers of, for taking power. It was a fighting organization. Internally, it was organized on the lines of democratic centralism. A full democratic debates, but once an internal debate had taken place on a question, uh, a vote would be held and the majority policy would become the policy of the party and the party members had to follow the line and carry out the decisions. Just like it, it takes place uh, at a factory or workplace when the workers discuss whether to strike or not. You have a debate, you take a vote, and then you decide whether everybody strikes or not. Uh, these Luxembourgists, in order to try and pit uh, Luxembourg against Lenin, uh, and claim that Luxembourg thought he was an undemocratic, un ultra-centralist, uh, they use uh, a special article. Uh, it's an article from 1904 called The Organizational Questions of the Russian Social Democracy. I think it has been renamed, so I don't remember the exact title, but something like Mas Marxism versus Leninism uh, by, by someone in uh, probably in the 70s which says everything because that is not the original title that Luxembourg gave that article, but it, it shows how they try to distort it. Uh, here she denounced Lenin and the Bolsheviks for their ultra centralism, And she even um, uh, accused them of, of uh, blankism. Uh, blankism is the idea uh, of organizing a, a social revolution by a small conspirational uh, group of revolutionary leaders, basically a coup. Uh, like Lenin, Luxembourg, she, she wasn't, um, how can you say that, weak in words. When she meant something, she said it very harshly. But also like Lenin, she wasn't afraid of, uh, of uh, admitting later if she had been wrong in her harsh words. 
1903, in the split between the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks, she initially sided with the Mensheviks. She knew a lot of the Menshevik leaders personally and believed uh, their side of, of the story of, of what happened in, in the 1903 Congress. The reality is that Luxembourg didn't understand what Lenin was striving for uh, in, in 1904 when, when she wrote the article. I think the truth is that very few, if any, really uh, did at the time. But if you look at the article, the Luxembourgists, they, they, they actually take her argument and turn it uh, on its head. In the article, she doesn't say that the kind of party that Lenin is building will establish a bureaucratic dictatorship after the revolution. It is not, as the Luxembourgists say, a warning against the Stalinist degeneration. What she says is that the party that Lenin is striving to build uh, is in danger of degenerating before the revolution, uh, degenerating into a sect and therefore risks not being capable of carrying out a revolution. So she's not against a, re a revolutionary organization or revolutionary leadership. She's debating what kind is the best in order to secure the victory of the workers. And furthermore, she changed her mind. And this is never mentioned by, by the Luxembourgists. They just pick and choose what they want to use from her. In articles and at the Congress in, in 1907 uh, of the Russian party, she said that experience of 1905 uh, had shown her to be uh, um, wrong. She said that her warnings about blankism being inherent in Bolshevism in 1904 belonged to the distant past, that is a quote. And from 1905 and after she sided with the Bolsheviks on all fundamental questions against the Mensheviks. And later in 1918, together with Karl Liebknecht, she set out to form the German Communist Party as part of the Communist International i.e. building a revolutionary party. So to say that she is diametrically opposed to Lenin on this uh, question is sheer dishonesty. There is no fundamental difference between Lenin and Luxembourg in their understanding of the masses and the need for organization. They were just in different roles and different situations. The masses move when they are ready. The outbreak of struggles, mass strikes, revolutions uh, are mainly, or in most, most examples, uh, spontaneous in nature, but they also agreed on the need for revolutionaries to build a working class party and to politically intervene and lead the masses. You could say the difference was that Lenin understood and carried out uh, the need to build a revolutionary cater organization. I will, I will get back to that uh, in the end. But before I, I return to that, I will go into the second myth, the, the question of the Russian revolution. Uh, the, the main myth is that Rosa Luxemburg was opposed to Bolshevism uh, and the Russian re Revolution in 1905 and the Bolsheviks, uh, how they acted during that revolution and after. Uh, and this is a, a lie, a pure lie. Uh, the text that is used to create this myth is the only longer text she wrote about the subject uh, called The Russian Revolution, written in 1918. And I think you have all seen inspirational quotes in in nice graphic uh, floating around uh, on Facebook, uh, trying to portray uh, Luxembourg as this uh, defender of democracy against uh, the dictatorship of, of Russia and the Bolsheviks. Uh, the Luxembourgists, they try to use the article to portray Rosa Luxembourg as a defender of bourgeois parliamentarianism. That's difficult to say, <laughs> parliamentarism, uh, as opposed to Soviet power, <laughs> sorry. Basically saying, as you can be a revolutionary, you can be a Marxist, you can follow Rosa Luxemburg, uh, but within this system, within the capitalist democratic system. Uh, yet again, this is absolutely false. This was not the ideas of Rosa Luxemburg. First of all, some facts regarding uh, when and under what conditions the article was written. Uh, facts that the Luxemburgists uh, completely ignore when they use the article. They never mention these things. Uh, when the Russian Revolution uh, broke out, uh, it was during the First World War, uh, and Rosa Luxemburg was in prison. She was put in, in prison by the German authorities for her own safety, which, which meant she had no, no sentence and, and no right to, to try to have that sentence overturned and no uh, time limit for when she would get out. And she was only freed by the German Revolution. Uh, I think it must have been really, really frustrating for her. Uh, her access to information was extremely limited and also, and I think she, she knew this, 
uh, what information she was fed was being uh, filtered through the, the, the German authorities. So, so she wasn't getting the, the clear picture. Uh, so she wrote down her observations for, for her own clarification. And she refused uh, to publish it because she knew full well that it would be uh, distorted by the enemies of the revolution. Uh, Clara Setkin, who was a close friend of, of Luxembourg, stated uh, that after Luxembourg was released from prison in November 1918, she had said that her views had been wrong and based on insufficient information. The text was only published three years after her death. Uh, it was published in 1922 by Paul Leve, uh, without Luxembourg ever giving, uh, allowing him to do it. Well, at the time she was dead, so obviously not, but not, not before then either. Uh, at that time, Paul Levy had just been uh, uh, expelled from the German Communist Party, and it was a way of, um, of getting back at, uh, at the movement. Uh, so you should think that you should take this text uh, and use it with a bit of care. Uh, but the Luxembourgers, they, they don't do that. But all that being said, you cannot read the text and come to the conclusion that Luxembourg was opposed to the October Revolution or the Bolsheviks. It is only if you take quotes completely out of con context and completely distort the entire article that you can portray it like this. And I dare anyone who, who thinks that to read the, the article from end to beginning. The text both begins and ends with long praises of the revolution, the Bolsheviks and Lenin and Trotsky. I have taken one quote uh, but there are many, many like this throughout the article. In the beginning as, of the article, as far as I remember, uh, Luxembourg uh, wrote the following. Whatever a party could offer of courage, revolutionary farsightedness, farsightedness and consistency in an historic hour, Lenin, Trotsky and all the other comrades have given in good measure. All the revolutionary honor and capacity which Western social democracy lacked was represented by the Bolsheviks. Their October uprising was not only the actual salvation of the Russian revolution, it was also the salvation of the honor of international socialism. I think from this quote alone, it should be quite clear. And as I said, there are several quotes like this. These are not the ones that are, that are put on, on an inspirational uh, graphic on, on Facebook. What is taken uh, from the article is that she raised some concrete uh, points of criticism against the Bolsheviks. But her criticism is a comradely critique of specific steps taken by the Bolsheviks, not a denunciation of the October Revolution. And mainly it was written as a warning uh, against thinking you could take the experience from, from the Russian Revolution and mechanically transfer uh, that onto, for example, Germany. Uh, and she explained that the problems uh, facing the Russian Revolution and, and the Bolsheviks was a direct consequence of the isolation of the revolution uh, in, in the backward, backward conditions of, of the country. And she laid the responsibility for this uh, on the shoulders of the German working class and not least the leadership of the German working class. Uh, and she explained that this, the solution to the problems faced by the revolution and, and the Bolsheviks uh, was to break the isolation of the country by carrying out the German revolution. And the purpose of the, of the article and, and the task of the German revolutionaries was to learn from the Russian experience in order to prepare for the German revolution. So if we read the article in its entirety, instead of picking out and, and choosing quotes out of context uh, in order to misrepresent her views, it, it's impossible to interpret Rosa Luxemburg as being against uh, Lenin and Trotsky and the Bolsheviks. She agreed with the way the October Revolution was carried out. She agreed with what Lenin and Trotsky had to do to defend the young Soviet Republic. And as a genuine internationalist, she understood that the German Revolution had to succeed in order to save the Russian Revolution and, and come to their aid. And when she faced the problems of the revolution, she, she ended up with the same conclusions and, as the Bolsheviks. Because a few months after she had written this article, the, the German revolution did break out. It released Rosa from, from prison. Uh, and from then on, she threw all she had into securing the, the victory of, of the German revolution. And here, the, the problems of revolution became concrete. 
Uh, one of the things that she had criticized the Bolsheviks for was the disbanding of the constituent assembly. Uh, it's a criticism that is eagerly seized upon by those uh, reformers who try to portray uh, Lenin and Trotsky as uh, undemo undemocratic or anti-democratic or author authoritarian uh, as against Luxembourg's democratic socialism. But what was the facts? Uh, the Bolsheviks throughout their history had supported the call for a constituent assembly, uh, seeing this as a step forward from uh, Tsarist uh, despotism. But when they, um, at the time of its dissolution in January 1918, the constituent assembly, it no longer represented the Russian masses. Uh, the Russian masses, they were organizing their power in a higher form of, of government, uh, the Soviets, who were based on the power of the working class. Uh, no bourgeois parliament is capable of expressing the rapidly changing views of the mass of working people in the course of a revolutionary upheaval. Quite the opposite, it becomes the force of derailing uh, the actions of the masses into a, a careerist uh, debating club to take the power out of, of the, 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 the movement of the masses. And the Constituent Assembly in Russia uh, was lagging behind revolutionary events. Uh, it had became, become a focal point uh, of counter-revolutionary forces uh, who worked to defend the essence of the reactionary Tsarist uh, regime. The Constituent Assembly had come into being when its exist existence had been overtaken uh, by the real revolutionary events uh, and this justified its dissolution uh, by the Bolshevik government. By shutting down the Constituent Assembly, the, the Bolsheviks were not disbanding democracy, as it is claimed. Uh, rather, they were defending genuine workers' democracy uh, as represented by the Soviets. Uh, but from her prison cell, Rosa Luxemburg couldn't see this. Uh, and in, in her article, she, she asked, which is basically a question for herself, uh, because it was a question of self-clarification. She asked, why can't the Constituent Assembly and the Soviet, why can't they exist side by side? Uh, but she answered that question herself uh, when, it, when she faced the same situation in Germany uh, just a few months later. In November 1918, uh, in the German Revolution, workers' councils sprung up throughout Germany. And the leadership of the SPD, who at this time had become thoroughly reformist and, and pillars of support for, for, for capitalism, in the revolution, they pushed for a calling of a national assembly, which is basically the same as a constituent, constituent assembly. And it became clear for Rosa Luxemburg that this, this was a way uh, for the leadership of the SPD to try to derail the revolution uh, away from workers' councils into bourgeois democratic channels. It was part of their attempt to try and prevent a socialist revolution taking place in Germany. And now uh, Rosa Luxemburg could see this uh, clearly, uh, that the two, the National Assembly, the Constituent Assembly on one side and the Workers' Councils, the Soviets, they were mu mutually exclusive. And she called the National Assembly, and I quote, an outmoded legacy of bourgeois revolutions and empty shell. And she said, uh, to resort to the National Assembly today is consciously or unconsciously to turn the revolution back to the historical stage of bourgeois revolutions. Anyone advocating it is a secret agent of the bourgeoisie or an unconscious spokesman of petty bourgeois ideology. I think that says very clearly what she would uh, have thought of all these people who try to use her to, uh, to defend bourgeois democracy against the, the workers taking power. But these words uh, of Rosa are totally ignored by our uh, Luxembourgists of today. Uh, and, and the reason is, is quite clear. She is clearly calling for the abolition of bourgeois democratic national assembly. Does this mean that Rosa Luxemburg was out to destroy democracy? Uh, quite the contrary. Uh, Luxembourg, uh, in exactly the same manner as Lenin and Trotsky, was defending the real institutions of workers' democracy, the workers' councils, the Soviets, and she, and she was fighting the distraction and confusion that the National Assembly would have created for the revolution and basically exposing it uh, for being a tool of counter-revolution. So to conclude or to, to how can you say, to try and, and sum, up, sum up everything, if you look at the life of Rosa Luxemburg, she, she didn't get to fight this fight to the end. Her, her life was cut short. 
And I have sometimes been asked why I think it is that these left reformers can use Rosa Luxemburg. And I think this is why. She didn't lead a victorious revolution. She was killed. And she didn't live long enough to comment on the development taking place in Russia, and neither in the years after the revolution or, or during the Stalinist degeneration. And therefore, her ideas stayed a bit abstract, like her ideas on, on organization. And you don't have her uh, writing anything actually for publication on the Russian Revolution, for example. Uh, and I am sure that if she had lived longer, she would have been implacably on the side of the revolution. I'm sure she would have been a, a staunch enemy of, of the Stalinist degeneration. Uh, and I think she would have uh, been just as hated as Lenin by both the bourgeoisie and the reformists. After all, it, it was the reformists that had her killed. In January 1919, her life was cut short by the reactionary Freikorps soldiers. They were spurred on by the Social Democrat uh, who, who, who led a campaign, a murderous campaign against uh, Rosa Luxemburg uh, and the other outstanding leader of the German Communist Party, uh, Karl Liebknecht, uh, and, and the rest of the leadership of, of the newly formed German Communist Party. It happened at a time when the, when the Communist Party was only two weeks old. It had just been formed uh, on the New Year's Eve of 1918-1919. Uh, of the, the newly formed Communist Party was left without its head, uh, and the German Revolution was defeated, as we know. It was a catastrophe for, for the workers worldwide. It left the Russian Revolution isolated, and it paved the way for, for fascism in Germany. And I think as revolutionaries today we, and Marxists today, we have to ask ourselves, could it have been otherwise? What, what can we learn from, from this? And we have to look at the difference between Germany and, and Russia. Uh, why did the Russian Revolution succeed? And why was the German Revolution defeated? And of course, there are many different aspects. But I think the main and the decisive question was the existence of the Bolshevik party in Russia and the lack uh, of an equivalent in, in Germany. The Bolshevik party was a cater organization built over years. It was based on, on a sol solid foundation of Marxist theory uh, and had, worked, uh, had, had roots uh, in the working class. This was what Lenin had strived for and, and worked for since 1903. When we look at the German revolution, when that broke out, no such cater organization existed. The, the revolutionaries uh, was in, in a loose network uh, of a few thousands and only had 50 uh, in Berlin. The communist party was only formed during the revolution, two months into the revolution. Uh, at this time, it, it becomes clear in retrospective uh, that it was only Lenin who understood the need to build a revolutionary cater organization. For many years, Luxembourg uh, thought that the SPD would be the, become the revolutionary party or be the revolutionary party and that the, the masses of the workers would, uh, would force it to be the revolutionary party. Uh, but Lenin also for many years hold, hold uh, out the SPD as, as a model. In, in hindsight, I, I think it's, it's clear to see that what Rosa Luxembourg should have done was to build uh, a revolutionary tendency uh, long before inside the SPD. Uh, and that would have made the split between the reformists and the revolutionaries much clearer when, when it happened. But it is much easier to see in hindsight. But we know what happened in the German and the Russian revolution. So I think Luxembourg might, might be excused, but, but the point is her followers are not excused. Us who live today are not excused if we don't learn from the experience. We have, on the basis of the experience of the Russian and German revolution, we can see that Lenin was correct in, in realizing the need to build a cater organization. And towards the end of her life, Luxembourg drew the same conclusion and set out to form the German Communist Party. So I think now it's time for us to reclaim the revolutionary legacy of, of Rosa Luxemburg and to learn from, from her life and her experience. Uh, and it is up to us to fulfill the task set by Rosa Luxemburg, Lenin, and, and all the other revolutionaries that came before us to struggle with all that we have in order to secure the victory of the socialist world revolution. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Marie, for this introduction. And I really hope it makes people who have listened want to buy the book written by Marie and delve into this topic. Now we're going to move straight into the discussion period. 
The first speaker will be Ben Glenetsky from the British section of the IMT. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you to Marie for a really great introduction. So comrades, Lenin explained that in every revolution, the most basic question is the question of state power. The bourgeois state must be smashed by the revolution and, and replaced with a worker state. And attempts to reform the bourgeois state or transform it into a tool of the workers are doomed to fail. And it's this that distinguishes reformists from revolutionaries. And, and this question formed a very important part of Rosa Luxemburg's battle against reformism, against revisionism. In her text, Reform or Revolution, she wrote, the theory of the gradual introduction of socialism proposes progressive reform of capitalist property and the capitalist state in the direction of socialism. Bernstein, the, the theoretician of revisionism, of reformism, Bernstein proposes to change the sea of capitalist bitterness into a sea of socialist sweetness by pouring into it bottles of social reformist lemonade. And, she's, and Rosa Luxemburg says, this is a ridiculous idea because she goes on to say, the production relations of capitalist society approach more and more towards the production relations of socialist society. And that is to say that as capitalism expands, it socializes production from individual craftsmen to production lines that span the globe, involving thousands of workers. But on the other hand, she, she continues, in its political and juridical relations, that is to say the state, they establish between capitalist and socialist society a steadily rising wall. So even as capitalism socializes production on the question of the state, the, the, it establishes a wall between, between private and uh, or between capitalism and socialist society. And she says, this wall is not overthrown, but on the contrary, it's actually strengthened by the development of social reforms and the course of democracy. Only the hammer blow of revolution, which is the conquest of political power by the proletariat, can break that wall down. Now, this is a really crucial theoretical point. Luxembourg is saying that social reforms willingly granted by a bourgeois democratic regime can actually strengthen the capitalist state as a weapon of class rule because the illusion is created that the state acts in the interests of all classes. Of course, we are in favor of reforms, but how you win the reforms is the crucial question. We want class struggle to force the ruling class to grant those reforms because that strengthens the working class. It strengthens the confidence of the workers in their own institutions and their own abilities which prepares the working class for the revolutionary overthrow of capitalism and the capitalist state. What we do not want is to debate, convince, trade favors with the bourgeois state, with, with diplomacy or parliamentary maneuvers and so on. This is not our method for winning reforms because it demobilizes the working class and it builds illusions in the capitalist state and it throws back the struggle for revolution. Now, Luxembourg took this up theoretically against Bernstein, but also concretely against Millerand and some of the French social democrats. Millerand was a, a socialist politician who joined a bourgeois government in France. He aimed to secure gains for the working class, yes, but not through class struggle, but through deals and diplomacy and parliamentary cretinism. Now, the result of that was that instead of Millerand reforming the bourgeois government and, and making the bourgeois government a bit more socialist, the French bourgeoisie used Millerand as a, as a left cover for their reactionary policies. They made him a bit more capitalist. Now, Luxembourg fought very hard against Millerandism. She, she wrote the following. The entry of a socialist into a bourgeois government is not a partial conquest of the bourgeois state by socialists, 
but a partial conquest of the Socialist Party by the bourgeois state. Marie explained how the question of state power was posed very sharply by the Russian Revolution. And Marie explained how Luxembourg was initially inconsistent in applying her own ideas to this concrete situation. She recognized the supreme importance of the Soviets as the basis for a new worker state. But at the same time, she argued that a constituent assembly, a bourgeois parliament should also be convened because she said it could be pushed to the left by the masses. And this is a, this is a vacillating, this is a middle position which tries to combine the smashing of the bourgeois state machine with reforming it, with pushing it to the left. But this, as Maria explained, this was corrected by Luxembourg during the revolution in Germany. The same question of the state was posed point blank. Should there be a state based on the workers' councils or should it be based on a bourgeois democratic national assembly? And Luxembourg's position could not have been clearer. She wrote, no evasions, no ambiguities, the die must be cast. Yesterday, parliamentary cretinism was a weakness. Today, it is an ambiguity. Tomorrow, it will be a betrayal of socialism. In other words, any illusions in bourgeois democracy were condemned by Luxembourg as a betrayal of socialism. These were the revolutionary ideas of Rosa Luxembourg on the state. If we can steal ourselves in these ideas, then the workers' state that we will build in the future will be her legacy. Thanks, comrades. Thank you very much, Ben. That was an excellent contribution. So it's, it's been pointed out in Mary's introduction that one of the main lessons of the life of Rosa Luxemburg is, is the need to build a strong revolutionary party in advance of revolutions. And this is what the IMT is trying to do incorporating these lessons into our work today. But to build such an organization, we, we have the ideas, but we need the money also to put these ideas to the workers and youth. So if you're enthused by what you've heard so far, I would strongly urge you to make a donation to the IMT. Every penny goes a long way into helping us, helping us building the Revolutionary Party all across the world. To do so, you can go to donate.marxist.com. Next up, we'll have Stamatis from the Greek section of the IMT. Rosa Luxemburg, in addition to her important general contribution to Marxist theory, was particularly distinguished in the important theoretical and political cause of Marxism polemic against reformism. And it will not be an exaggeration to say that Rosa and the founder of the Russian Marxism, Georgi Plekhanov, produced the most systematic and complete responses to reformism's most prominent theorist, Edward Bernstein. Bernstein, from 1896 to 1898, in his articles in the German uh, social democratic journal Neue Zeit, and in his book, the conditions of socialism had put forward the idea that socialists should emancipate themselves from outdated phraseology, meaning the revolutionary ideas, and become the party of reforms. Bernstein's revisionist theory raised the question of the true relationship between reform and revolution. According to Bernstein and his followers in the German social democracy, the constant pursuit of legitimate reforms can lead gradually and without the need for revolution to socialism. Rosa's response came with a series of articles and documents in 1898 and 1899 that make up her work reform on revolution. And this was the beginning of Rosa's five-year theoretical struggle against Bernstein conceptions with various documents. Rosa, in her answer to the general question of the relationship between reform and revolution, while defending as an orthodox Marxist the revolutionary road to socialism, does not renounce, as the frivolous ultra-left sectarians might consider, reforms in general, 
She explained that revolution and reform are not two different methods of historical progress that someone can choose from the buffet of history, but they are different moments in the evolution of class society. In history, she explained, progressive reforms are, as a rule, the product of revolutions. She pointed out that whoever, in the name of struggle for democracy, chooses reform as a substitute and opposite element to revolution, does not choose a peaceful path for the same purpose, but in fact chooses another purpose. Instead of worker power and socialism, he or she chooses capitalism and one of the political forms of bourgeoisie's rule, bourgeois democracy. So Rosa was not at all against reforms, but in the struggle for reforms, she saw the means of preparing, organizing, and educating the working class for the seizure of power. Of particular value in her work, Reform or Revolution, is the Marxist critique of Bernstein ideas on the questions of the capitalist economy and the character and the role of labor unions. Because according to Bernstein, who arbitrarily generalized a phase where capitalism was developing, and could in Western Europe make concessions of a few crumbs to the working class, of course, from the table of robbery of the colonies. According to Bernstein, capitalism is capable of adaptation and its, and its economic crises are now light and momentary fluctuation. He argued that the contradictions of capitalism are no longer acute, and this makes socialism no longer objectively necessary. And so socialism cannot be founded scientifically, but only morally, and it returns to the state it was before Marx and Utopia. According to Bernstein, the means to overcome this contradiction is, on the one hand, the development of credit, and on the other hand, the development of trusts and cartels. In relation to credit, Rosa replied that it does not prevent the crisis from occurring, but instead makes it more acute than it occurs. In periods of capitalist prosperity, credit increases the possibilities of expansion of production, but it does not deal with the basic contradiction that produced the crisis. And that is the contradiction between the expansionary tendency of production and the private property of the means of production. Because as soon as the first symptoms of recession appear, Credits falls and stops expanding just when the system needed. In this way, it worsened the crisis. And in relation to cartels and trusts, Rosa explained that it may appear that at the national market level, these monopolies eliminate competition. But because the global market is imposed on all states, cartels and trusts in international level make the competition much softer. So do not soften, but sharpen the contradiction of the system. Finally, reflecting the illusions created at this period by the increasing power of the trade unions in Germany, Bernstein wrote in his book that the struggle of the trade unions would gradually reduce profits so much that surplus value would eventually disappear and exploitation itself would be abolished. But according to Rosa, unions, by demanding higher wages for better uh, purchasing power, of course, they do not abolish surplus value and exploitation. And she explained that trade union struggle is like the work of Sisyphus, who was condemned by Zeus to carry on his back a large rock up a mountain, which was falling from the mountain, and the process of transportation started again. And uh, that's why the bureaucrats of the German uh, unions declare Rosa as enemy of the trade union. They argued that unions would gradually gain power in big enterprises, firstly together with the employers and then without them. But for Rosa, the co-management of trade unions and bosses in big business with joint price fixing would constitute an employer labor cartel at the expense of the entire working class, but also a blow against the militancy of the labor movement. Thank you very much, Tamatis, for this excellent contribution. 
So before we move on to the next contribution, I want to strongly encourage everyone listening to check our, our theoretical magazine. Our theoretical magazine, In Defense of Marxism, comes out every three months, contains exclusive articles on various aspects of Marxist theory and history. The issue of this summer contains a, an article on the American Civil War, which is a fascinating topic that all Marxists should learn about. And at a time where inflation is ravaging the savings of working class people, we also have a theoretical article on Marxism, money, and inflation. So I strongly recommend you go to our website and take a subscription to In Defense of Marxism. The magazine is also available in German, in Russian, and in Swedish, as well as a Spanish version called America Socialista. So get your subscription today. Now the next speaker will be Comrade Oscar from the Swedish section of the IMT. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, comrades. Uh, I would just like to give uh, one example of uh, how the legacy of Rosa Luxemburg is being distorted. I think in general, the enemies of Marxism have uh, two main ways of discouraging uh, radical people from revolutionary politics. The first way is what was done with uh, Lenin and the Bolsheviks, for example. It's to attack the image of the leaders of Marxism ruthlessly. They make Lenin out to be a bloodthirsty dictator responsible for the death of millions. And they equate Bolshevism uh, with Stalinism. Of course, none of this is true. We know that. But it serves the purpose of alienating people from genuine Marxism. The second way is what is to transform the person in question into a harmless symbol, uh, a person who doesn't stand for anything that can really harm the capitalist system. And I think this second example is what was done with Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, the reformists, the feminists, the anarchists, they have time and time again distorted her views through quoting out of context and misunderstanding what she actually wrote. Consciously or not, they have often ended up portraying her views as being the opposite of what they actually were. I actually read, recently read an article which was published in the American left-wing magazine Jacobin where this is the case. It was published uh, last year. And I think it's a good example of how this uh, distortion is usually done. The article was actually called The Revolutionary Legacy of Rosa Luxemburg. So sounds good. But ironically, the whole point of the article seems to be to argue that she tried to combine reformism and revolutionary politics. You see, what they did first is that it distorts the question of the fight for actual reforms in general and the ideology of reformism. And they make it out uh, to seem as if us revolutionaries are against the reforms themselves and not the ideology of reformism. And then they say, and I'm gonna quote from the article now, when Luxembourg criticized Bernstein, her main point of dissatisfaction was that Bernstein was committed to dismantling the very ideal of socialism as access to political power. It's not a question of saying that Luxembourg is a revolutionary and not a reformist. It's rather a question of seeing what purpose reform should serve. That's the end of the quote. So in other words, they are saying that we shouldn't bother with this question of reformism or, or revolution and that they can actually be combined. They literally say that reform and revolution uh, weren't different ways of doing things. And obviously this is a great argument if you want to keep the question of how the workers can actually take power away from the discussion. But for Marxists, the question of reformism or revolution is not something that can just be brushed away so easily. It's a crucial question. We will obviously always fight for reforms, but you can't reform capitalism into socialism. That's what we believe. And Rosa Luxemburg, she fought against reformism her whole life, as the comrades have explained, and she gave her life in the struggle for a socialist revolution, which is what makes it especially scandalous that reformists and opportunists of all kinds try to use these quotes out of context to make it seem as if she stood for something that is the opposite of what she actually fought for. And this article, uh, it also claims that she was against the organizing of a party along the lines of the Bolsheviks. And even though the author uh, admits that she defended the Russian Revolution of 1917, 
they used the debates she had with Lenin about the party and the role of the masses to present it as if uh, Bolshevism automatically led to Stalinism. And in the end of the article, they, they do their best, but they struggle to present this new Luxembourgism, so to speak, which is supposed to be a con continuation or a development of Marxism, but whose most prominent feature is to combine reformism and revolution. So in the end, we are left with uh, Rosa Luxemburg as a harmless thinker who develops her own Marxism. And with the help of half-truth, distortions, and lies, uh, this is presented in contradiction to the so-called dictatorship of Lenin. And the aim of all of this is to stop all of those people who come into contact with things such as uh, revolutions, Marxism, Luxemburg, and Lenin, is to stop them from drawing the conclusions that should flow from reading about uh, the life and the work of Lenin and uh, Luxembourg. Uh, so I think it's uh, time that we drag the legacy of Rosa Luxemburg out of the dirt so that we can truly learn from her life and struggle and prepare uh, a victory for our class in the future. Thank you, comrades. Thank you very much, Oscar. So the last speaker today will be Fred Weston from the International Secretariat of the IMT. And then we'll have Marie give uh, her concluding remarks to the discussion. Okay, well, it's been a, a very good discussion, an excellent lead off by Marie. And it, uh, it was long overdue, I think, a book by ourselves on Rosa Luxemburg. For decades now, I've had Rosa Luxemburg in the background as this person that you had to explain a lot about. Uh, because she would always come up in the movement as a figure, as comrades have explained, an alternative to Leninism. In the 1970s in Italy, I remember she was very fashionable. Whenever anybody used Rosa Luxemburg, it was never to bring out the revolutionary side of her. It was always about everything else but her revolutionary ideas. And it was... I remember she was quite popular in the, in the left wing of the Italian Socialist Party in the 1970s, because you had, you had a phenomenon then, which you could, you could describe it as a, as, a, as a kind of centrism that emerged. I, you know, this, this sudden lurch to the left in words, in moments of class struggle, I like in the 1970s. It was, centrism is a phenomenon that appears in moments of acute class struggle. And these socialist leaders trying to give themselves a left image as they move to the left under the pressure found in Rosa Luxemburg a useful tool. But I was, I, I was looking through some of her letters and it's clear that Rosa Luxemburg realized long before Lenin how far the leaders of the SPD had degenerated. She was very close to the Kautskys Kautsky and his wife. But, you know, in, in, in uh, Easter 1908, she went on a trip with Kautsky to Lake Geneva. And it was in this trip that she started to lose the illusions that she had had. She could see the personality of this friend that she had. She, she, she realized for the first time that she found him boring monotonous, with no imagination, and heavy going, and he was heavy to listen to. And she realized then that her long-held friendship was now in decline. It was from then that she, she expressed in her letters that she found the Sunday dinners at the Kautskys, she found them boring. And then she said, soon, this is in one of her letters, 27th of June, 1908, Soon, I will not be able to read one line of Kautsky. It's like a disgusting mass of cobwebs from which you can free yourself only by a mental bath of Marx. So she had begun to see the limitations. And in fact, she expressed the position she found herself in in a letter to Clara Zetkin in 1907. This is what she wrote. I feel quite isolated. August, she's referring here to Babel, August Babel, and the others have gone over completely 
to parliamentarism. So she, she explains that the left used her, the, 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 the official left, that is the August Babel. In reality, he was the center of the party. He used um, Rose Luxburg against Bernstein. But then this is what she says in her letter. When it comes to launching an offensive against opportunism, the older leaders always side with Eddie. Eddie is um, Bernstein, actually. Volmar and David. Basically, she's saying, when it comes down to the real battle, they're always on the other side. And this is the dilemma she found herself in for years, actually, inside the party. Now, she finally came to the correct conclusions. Before dying, she understood the need to build the Communist Party. They, they, the myth they present of her as being anti-Leninist doesn't stand up to the test because she was building a party which was a section of the Communist International led by Lenin. What, um, what the so-called Luxembourgists really express when they use Luxembourg is that they reject the discipline of a revolutionary party. They reject its centralism I, to, 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 the, to its revolutionary essence. Now, Marie explained, she compared you know, Lenin's 20-year battle for the Bolshevik party. And eventually, of course, the Bolshevik party emerged after years of being a faction with, together with the Mensheviks into an independent force. But it took years to achieve that. Now, sometimes I find a, a stupid polemic on the left about what should Rosa have done. She should have split a long time before. That's not the point. Point is, she should have organized a faction like the Bolshevik party. That's what she should have done inside the party and prepare the ground for what Lenin eventually achieved. Something else that Rosa did realize that is not highlighted, she realized the difficulties that the Bolsheviks faced once they came to power. And she did not criticize them for taking power. That's the false picture that they present. She understood the problems faced by the revolution in isolation. And she says this very, very clearly. She also puts the blame for this isolation on the leaders of the SPD in Germany. Because by not carrying out the revolution in Germany, they contributed directly to the isolation of the Russian Revolution. And see how important this was for Lenin. In March 1918, in a speech, Lenin said this, it is the absolute truth that without a German revolution, we are doomed. This was the clarity of Lenin on the, on the need for the German revolution. Now we're discussing history here, it's easy to see the mistakes after a hundred years. But imagine if the German revolution had succeeded. Imagine the effect that would have had across the whole of Europe. The, the, the Russian revolution was not an isolated revolution in the sense it wasn't just one revolution. Uh, there was a revolution in many countries. There was the German revolution 1918. Hungary, 1919, Italy, 1920. A few years later, you had China in 1926 and the, the big general strike in Britain in the same year, 1926. And then of course, the revolutionary events in Spain and France in the 1930s. And then of course, even when the communist party was created in Germany, it was infantile, inexperienced, and suffered also from um, ultra leftism. And, and this affected many of the communist parties in Europe. So a discussion on Rosa Luxemburg is about what? We take the best of Rosa, we underline that she was a revolutionary, but we also don't look with, um, how do you, we look at it with open eyes. We also see the mistakes, but they were genuine mistakes of a genuine revolutionary. She was also capable of learning from her mistakes, which she did many times. But as Marie said, she was weak on particularly the question of organization. So what, what monument can we build to Rosa Luxemburg? 
well, first of all, build a genuine Bolshevik organization in Germany, uh, which we are doing, we are beginning to do, and also do it on a global scale. And remember, we have to be, pre be prepared long before the events. That's the difference between the experience of Bolshevism in Russia and Rosa Luxemburg in Germany. When the revolution broke out, the Germans were not ready. They were not ready both theoretically and organizationally. This school is about educating our comrades in theory to avoid repeating those mistakes and then build an organization to take those ideas into the movement. Thank you very much for that, Fred. And thank you to everyone who contributed to the discussion. That was excellent. So now I will turn it back to Marie for the conclusion. Thank you, Julian. Uh, and thank you to, to all who contrib contributed in the discussion. I, I think it has been marvelous, some really good contributions. First of all, I want to say that this, this uh, discussion has been, um, and, and my lead off was very limited in scope. There are many, many questions that I didn't touch upon. Uh, this talk focused on these two main myths that, that, that has been created by, by all those like the Jacobin magazine and, and people like that, who, who tries to, to take Luxembourg and, and use it for their own purpose. Uh, but there, there are many other questions. Of course, she, she lived a, a long, well, not long life, but uh, until she was 47, there was many questions she, she touched about upon and things where I think she was correct and things where I think she was wrong. But I think it's essential to, to take the essence of, of of her life and, and her legacy. And I think mistakes she made and, and all she did, she did from the perspective of fighting for revolution. Uh, and, and because she had an un, unwavering faith in the, in the working class and their ability to take power. Uh, in opposition to most of those who, who try to use her, who, who has no faith in uh, in the working class, but calls themselves Marxist anyway. I think Luxembourg was a Marxist in the true Marxist sense, <laughs> if you can say that. There are many Marx, so-called Marxists today, academic Marxists, who, who, is, who use the, the method and analysis of, of Marx and find them interesting to look at different aspects of, of society today. But Marx said it very clearly himself. I don't have the quote here, so it's it's from memory. But he said something like, it was not up to me to, to, to invent the notion of class struggle. And if you look at society today, there are many who accept the notion of class struggle also in the bourgeoisie. That doesn't make you a Marxist to talk about class struggle and the existence of classes. No, Marx said his contribution, and here's an English contribution, was the realization that the workers could not take, as Ben pointed out, could not take the bourgeois state and use it for its own purposes. That the workers had to smash the bourgeois state uh, and, and create a new state, a, a worker state. And this is what Rosa Luxemburg uh, fought for. And I think it's worth uh, quoting uh, Lenin when it comes to Luxembourg. Uh, he he write, wrote an article in, uh, I don't remember when, 1919 maybe, where he lists some, some points where he thought Rosa Luxemburg was wrong, like the national question, a question that they never agreed on. But first of all, he says, he, he wrote in uh, left-wing communism, uh, he says, what applies to individuals also applies with necessary modifications to politics and parties. It is not he who makes no mistakes that is intelligent. There are no such men, nor can there be, it is he whose errors are not very grave and who is able to rectify them easily and quickly that is intelligent. This is, he said in you know, it was not related to Luxembourg. But in relation to Luxembourg, he, he used a, a Russian um, proverb to describe, to describe her after her death. And he said, eagles may at times fly lower than hens, but hens can never rise to the height of an eagle. In spite of her mistakes, she was and remained for us an eagle. This is Lenin's appraisal of Rosa Luxemburg. 
So when we say we, we want to reclaim the legacy of Luxembourg, it is not down to every dot and comma she ever wrote. She is being used uh, to try and derail young people who are getting radicalized away from revolutionary ideas. And these people belong to revolutionary Marxism and not to some uh, left reformism. The young people who are looking for revolutionary ideas, they belong in the IMT. And that is why we're trying to save the legacy of Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, and, and I want to, to give another quote. I apologize to the translators. Because I think also what Fred pointed out, what is the purpose of, of this, this, uh, this school we are having now? And what was the purpose of, of Rosa Luxemburg uh, in her life? Uh, and what is uh, always forgotten by these left reformists? Or not forgotten, but hidden. They ridicule the fact that we are orthodox Marxists, that we focus on theory. Yeah, and this is what Rosa Luxemburg had to, to say about theory and the need for theory. Yeah, she says, what appears to characterize the practice uh, that is reformism above all? A certain hostility to theory. This is quite natural. For our theory, that is the principles of scientific socialism, impose clearly marked limitations to practical activity insofar as it concerns the aims of this activity, the means used in attaining these aims, and the method employed in this activity. It is quite natural for people, for people who run after immediate practical results to want to free themselves from such limitations and to render that practice independent of our theory. I think this is quite an excellent reply to all those reformers that you can uh, meet in overflow today also, who try to dismiss theory as something um, unnecessary, but also to the other side of the coin, those who are Marxist in, in the academic scholastic way, where you just sit and discuss and you take no practical consequences and organize. For Luxembourg and for us, theory is a guide to action. That is why we study and that is why we have discussions like these. And, and what she did, and I think Fred uh, explained this very well in, in this uh, debate in, in the German SPD, and I think this is one of her strongest points, the debate against Bernstein and revi revisionism. She took the discussion head on, where the, lead, the, then, the, the leaders of the SPD, they tried to avoid, ah, this is a question of nuance, this is, this is not uh, important for the practical questions right now, and, and so on. Uh, and one of the one of the leaders actually said uh, to to Bernstein, uh, "Dear friend, we don't usually go around saying these things; we just do them. I we we don't uh, throw ourselves into theoretical debates about revolution. We we just continue with our reformist practice. And I think that is the situation in most uh, working uh, class organizations today. And as has been explained very well by several um, contributions." The question of uh, reform and revolution is not a question of us or Luxembourg being, being against reforms. It is against the idea that capitalism can be reformed to a capitalism with a, with a human face. And I think this is also why th this is not a historical question, uh, the legacy of Rosa Luxembourg. Uh, th these questions that she touched upon uh, are the burning questions of today. She's famous for saying socialism or barbarism. I think that was actually uh, quoting Engels. But, but she has become famous for, for, for this, that, that the, the fate of uh, which humanity is facing is, is socialism or barbarism. And I think that is very clear today when it comes to, to, to wars, to climate change, to hunger, to, to the economy. And I think this is the, the main question for us why are we revolutionaries? If we look at history since, since the beginning of, of the workers' movement, since, it's, since the time of Rosa Luxemburg, it is very clear that all attempts to create this capitalism with, with a human face, the, the basic idea of reformism, uh, of the revision of, of Marxism that Bernstein uh, put forward, is that we slowly, reform by reform, can, can create a, a better capitalism. And that maybe sometime uh, that will automatically turn into socialism. 
but that that is not the important question. And I would say if I if that was true, that we bit by bit could could make lives better for the great majority uh, of humanity, I might be a reformist. But the problem is that is not how reality is. Life is not getting better for the big majority bit by bit. It was an historic except historical exception, the time of the post-war boom, the, a, a period where semi-civilized conditions could be created for some part of the working class in some part, part of the world. This is not how it is today. Capitalism finds itself in a blind alley and it cannot create a better life for the great majority of the population. And it cannot solve the burning questions that is in front of humanity. So the fact now is that we're not bit by bit uh, going towards a better, better future, quite the opposite. All that was won in the past uh, is now being taken back. So this discussion that was, I don't know if it was started, but, but between Bernstein and Luxembourg and, and other revolutionaries, the question of, of reform or revolution is just as valid today as, as it was back then. And you see the exact same arguments being, being put forward today. As I remember, the, the finance minister of uh, the Greek Syriza government, Vaufagis, uh, uh, at the time of, of the referendum and, and the fight against um, the, the European uh, Central Bank imposing uh, uh, cuts and austerity to, towards the Greek workers, he said something like, now is not the time to talk about socialism. First, we have to create uh, a better capitalism, and then we can talk about socialism. And there are arguments like this all over the, the left wing. But the point is, we cannot create a better capitalism. And therefore, the only way forward is to fight for socialist overthrow of this system. And, and to take this from Rosa Luxemburg, her, her faith in the working class to move, and also their ability to change society, but also to learn from her uh, in the negative sense, you could say, the need to beforehand, <laughs> before the revolution, to build a strong revolutionary cater organization capable of, of, um, of securing the victory of the working class. And I think that task is, uh, is up to us.